Lucas lecture on uh, the master's choice. My name is Darius. Uh, today for today's lecture I prepared uh, two games I would like to talk about and uh, they are based, uh, I mean they are from US championships that have been held uh, week, they finished a week ago, right? Uh, so um, the games I prepared are uh, my game versus Jeffrey Zhang and uh, other game of Ze Jeffrey actually against uh, Wesley So. And both had one thing in common that both were played in the one very sharp opening, which was Fishing Operation in the, in the Sicilian. This opening is very interesting, of course, it's one of the most uh, popular or and well studied uh, openings in Sicilia, in general in chess, but in specifically specifically in Sicilian along with Nidorf. Uh, so I think in general this opening positions are extremely complicated. Both sides uh, are not backing out. Both sides play as active and dynamic chess as possible. And uh, this leads to very interesting positions, so uh, I wanted to bring it up today. And uh, I will show, as I said, two games uh, from, US from US Championships when this opening happened. And we'll see how, um, what, what happened in both games. <laughs> Actually, in both games, White won, but this doesn't matter because the games, the Black had its own chances anyway. So let's just jump into it and uh, talk about um, the the games. So uh, I'm not sure whether I want to have it from White's perspective or Black's perspective. Probably for now from Black's perspective, because I play this game with Black. It's my game against Jeffrey Zhang. So e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, takes, takes, knight f6, knight c3, e5. Uh, I should also say that this, pub, this opening has always been very popular, but lately uh, has been, you know, even more popular because of the games of Magnus Carlsen who uh, used it against Fabiano Caruana in the World Championship match in 2018. And also after that, Magnus was playing very often with both uh, Sicilians. So um, thanks to Games of World Champion, um, there have been tremendous jump in theory and knowledge in this opening. So uh, therefore, even though I haven't played it before, I also began, you know, sort of employing this opening of myself as black, with black pieces. So knight b5, d6, uh, bishop g5. Another possibility is knight d5 here, which is what Sam Seven played against me in the first round of US Championships. And uh, also it is, it is actually the line that um, Fabiano Caruana was playing against Magnus in um, World Championship match. It is also very interesting different type of positions and uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, my game against Sam Sevian today. Uh, however, uh, I think in general Black is doing quite well there too. Uh, so Bishop G5 happened in my game against Jeffrey. A6, uh, Knight A3, B5, Knight, uh, sorry, Bishop takes F6. Uh, another possibility is Knight D5, which is what happened in uh, Wesley Wesley's game against Jeffrey. Uh, Bishop takes F6, however, is more, is it's, it's more concrete, it's much sharper, I think, than uh, knight d5. Knight d5 is considered as a little bit positional approach. For instance, after bishop e7, bishop f6 takes and uh, c3 or c4 are both positional uh, options for white. Um, rather calm, we're trying to prove the string of the d5 knight. However, bishop takes f6, gf, knight d5, of course, uh, queen f6 runs into knight d5 with tempi, and this is not something that white, uh, I mean sorry, black and joys. So g takes f6, right now the phrase is b4 obviously, so white has to go knight d5 and black plays f5. Other possibilities of course play bishop g7, which is what Magnus played. Uh, however, I, f I find f5 uh, as, you know, compelling choice personally, so I, I like it. And, and here there have been lots of theory, there have been all games of Garry Kasparov where against, I think, Alexei Shirov, where Alexei Shirov was playing bishop takes b5, sacrificing a piece. However, the current state of theory is that black is doing well there. And uh, at best, what I can hope for is a perpetual check or some or some draw, other draw. Uh, so those lines are, like bishop takes b5, are not really dangerous, particularly, I think, because rook a4 right now is a very strong move, the ring over the rook, and putting suppression on e4 pawn. After knight c7, king d7, black is generally considered as be doing quite well. Uh, so, um, 
the, the modern theory, how it develops, uh, has developed lately, w re sort of is like a revolving around bishop move bishop d3. And bishop d3 can happen in many, many options. Uh, first of all, uh, c3, uh, bishop g7 is what Jeffrey played, now bishop d3. This is one possibility. And second possibility is bishop d3 immediately. Bishop e6 and uh, short castle, I think I'm mistaken. Uh, and both options are very interesting and uh, I think in both white can have uh, has some chances to foreign advantage, however objectively black with correct play should be doing okay. Uh, I would like to discuss what Jeffrey would play against me because uh, after all, um, if he played he had to have something prepared and um, he had to study his opening. So c3, bishop g7, bishop d3, bishop e6. And now uh, Jeffrey played queen h5, which is uh, not as common as uh, other moves, I think. Uh, there, a few years ago, like maybe five, maybe 10, I'm not, not, not sure not exactly when we was it. Uh, knight b5 was considered as extremely dangerous. Uh, and uh, after this, bishop takes b5, uh, you know, uh, bishop d7, I think, is the, the line, he takes a 5, and there is basically, uh, white has basically two po three pawns for a piece, and uh, very good compensation for the, for this piece, especially with this such powerful knight on d5, those pawns on the queen side are likely to be, you know, marching forward. Uh, also, black's king is a little bit dangerous, and uh, because it's exposed. And uh, it's been considered uh, as a uh, good try for white to play uh, for a win. However, um, modern you know uh, theory uh, claims that black is also doing quite well here. However, the position is extremely complicated. Uh, I don't want to dive into specific variations because it's just so much to study here, and it's been studied for you know years for, and uh, by many grandmasters and so on and uh, studying just and memorizing you know like theory discussing right now is not my point it's not, not, not what I want to do I would like I would rather discuss uh, what happened in my game and uh, in general ideas that happens in this opening so uh, Queen h5 uh, this is what Jeffrey played, and I remember here there was one very interesting uh, approach here by Black. It's not the only approach, but I found it uh, as a very interesting one. Short castle, it takes f5, bishop takes d5, f6, and right now it seems like uh, white is getting, uh, Black is getting mated on h7, but white can, Black can play e4, uh, f takes g7, and now rook e8. This is all theory. Uh, black king uh, seemingly is exposed, but on the other hand is well guarded by this white pawn on g7. Of course, if uh, black would take this um, this pawn, uh, queen d5 would follow and uh, black, black uh, actually is losing a piece. However, uh, after rook e8, uh, this pawn on g7 actually shielding uh, black king from any checks and so on. Uh, so black king is actually pretty safe, even though it seems like it's exposed. So bishop e2 is the main move right now. And in this position, uh, black has basically two possibilities. They're knight e5 or rook e5. Rook e5, is I think, is the most popular one. Uh, and there have been main games. I think uh, uh, Liam Lequang played um, rook e5 in one of his games, and he won. It's also it's, it's decent uh, option for black. However, personally, when I was analyzing this on my own, I found knight e5 as, as pretty strong. And uh, I didn't find any problems here for black. Also, it's pretty really logical to just place the knight in the center, where it can uh, go many directions. It can go maybe to f3 because there is some pressure on the e file, or maybe uh, it also supports uh, bishop c4 ideas, where and then maybe uh, trying to get with knight to d3. It uh, seems uh, it seemed very logical approach by as black for me here. Uh, so after short castle, queen f6. This is basically the critical position. Right now, the white has big choice. And um, Jeffrey played pretty quickly move knight c2. And this is the move that I, hadn't ana that I didn't analyze in the past. I, but I analyzed something very similar. Also, I, did, I, had, I have to say that I didn't expect Jeffrey to play this line, so I didn't quite remember everything here. So uh, I saw the move knight c2 somewhere. But uh, no, it wasn't the exact position that I had in mind when uh, that I sort of uh, 
I saw this move by a different position. What I'm trying to say is, that I saw uh, after I after the game, I analyzed uh, this a little bit more, and I had by some reason Queen H3 as the main move. And the idea is that uh, after Rook B8, uh, Knight C2. The point of Queen H3 is simply to run away from all kind of tactics uh, involving Knight F3. And um, Knight C2, however, I by some reason I dismissed because I uh, presumed or something that uh, there is some tactics involving Knight F3. But during the game it wasn't so clear to me. On what I remember though that uh, I, there are ideas of Bishop C4. And uh, Bishop C4 um, is the move that basically trades a, 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 a pair of bishops, simplifies the position a little bit, and I want to land with my knight on d3 at some point, as, as I said earlier. But I wasn't sure whether in, in this position is it is, this is particularly great, and I didn't decide to go for it, especially that alternative was extremely tempting. But just to show quickly what can happen, bishop c4, bc, knight d3, I think the black is doing quite well after uh, queen g6, even though well, white is with, ex with, with an extra pawn. Pawn on g7 is gonna fall anyway at some point. And black can play, for instance, rook b8 soon, maybe some ideas with knight d3 in the future, considering, of course, the pawn c4 uh, will be defended. Um, knight, basically, I don't think black has too much of, uh, too many reasons to worry here. I think black is doing quite quite okay. But I had an alternative, which was very tempting. I spent lots of time calculating it, uh, which was move knight f3. And uh, knight f3, Move, the move knight f3 is the most critical move, and uh, it's by far um, the most challenging move for uh, for white. And I think Jeffrey missed it, but um, because uh, why I'm saying that he, I'm thinking that he missed it because after knight f3 he started thinking for a really really long time. And uh, the point is that after let's say g takes f3, I go simply rook e5, and suddenly his queen is trapped. He's losing his queen because after queen h3, I go bishop e6, chasing uh, his queen away, um, harassing his queen, I mean. And finally, if the queen goes to the g file somewhere, we can, I can play rook g5 and I simply uh, win, uh, win the queen. So knight, uh, so knight f3, I was really excited to play, obviously, but I, was I, I couldn't evaluate in the end what's happening. Uh, because he took with the bishop, this is what I was thinking is the best move. Of course, rook e5 has to be played. Right now, there are two moves, either queen g4 or queen h3. And uh, queen h3 is obviously correct. Queen g4 is incorrect uh, because, uh, first of all, it runs into bishop, rook g5 possibilities, so it goes under 10 piece. In all possible, all random lines, rook g5 is possible. So basically, it has to be dismissed immediately because it go, gives additional options for black. For instance, I can play right now maybe rook g5, I can maybe play it, take on a free and play it, then play rook g5. Um, and if I put my rook on g, the g file, uh, pawn on g2 will be also under attack. So it gives some additional tempest to black's attack. And so this is, should be dismissed. However, uh, queen h3 was my uh, main, uh, was the main thing I was calculating. He takes f3, and uh, right now knight a3. And basically, uh, here in the, I was when I was calculating knight f3, I was thinking about those lines, and um, the only move that I was considering here was the move I played here, uh, f takes g2. And this is this is a good move, uh, but there is but it's not necessary move uh, it, it, as it appears. Uh, what's going on here? Basically, white tries to play knight g4, right? And uh, this is uh, seem seemingly one of them. Also, um, and on top of knight g4 with the fork, there's also move like rook d1, rook d4. So there are basically two ideas that white has. And um, what white tries to accomplish is to place everything on the dark squares, neutralize my play on the light squares, and uh, prove that knight is stronger than the bishop uh, in the, let's say, middle game, and, and or maybe in some end games. Trading queens is definitely one of the good options for uh, for white, because white has better pawn structure. Let's say if we take off the, the queens of the board, let's say, in such following line, apart from the fact that white has extra pawn, this, sorry, uh, yeah, let's say extra pawn, pawn on d6 right now is a, is a weakness, white can play rook d1, rook d4 or something, and then double on the d file. On dark squares, white has full control on top of that extra pawn, so white should be should be uh, winning here. I, as black, I cannot trade queens. If I trade queens, it means that I'm much worse here. So I try to basically play as dynamic just as I could, 
Uh, however, I made a mistake um, later on. So here I play f takes g2. And this is a good move, as I said, but there is some there's alternative which is by far not 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 worse than this. And actually from practical standpoint, I think it's even better. The point is to play uh, the best move is practical choice. Uh, the best practical choice would be to play simply rook a e8. Idea, what is the idea? The rook is <laughs> the rook is not participating in the game. Bring it in. It's as simple as that. <coughs> if knight takes d5, uh, rook takes d5, uh, queen takes f3, if he just collects the pawn, I can play right now rook e2. With such active rooks, there are no any issues here for me at all. Uh, black is doing completely okay. Rook d2 is coming. I can have rook take the g7 g at any moment, and uh, black is doing simply great here. Uh, so, uh, knight, if some sort of like worry here is always knight g4, but suddenly queen knight g4 doesn't work tactically. I can play queen e6, only move, but it's sufficient. And after knight takes e5, suddenly I can play f takes g2. This is a move, of course, I didn't see. Um, and suddenly black is winning, or like at least it's much better. So, the point is that uh, after queen e6, for instance, I take here first uh, with check. Rook has to, or king has to take, and after this, uh, the, in this endgame, black is simply better because pawn only to. Uh, I mean, first of all, there's rook g6 checkmate. Actually, king of one is m way more accurate, just to be more precise right now. Rook takes e6, and the thing is that in this endgame, black is simply better. Uh, probably, yeah, black is simply better. I will not say that black is winning because they're probably a long way, but uh, definitely black has really good chances to win this. Uh, because of dynamics. They, it's unclear where this knight goes first. Uh, and I can take this pawn g7 any moment. Uh, black is doing simply great. So in this position, rook e8 was very, let's say, difficult move to play because like you normally from normally you want to just, you know, pawns on f3, just take further on g2. There's nothing wrong with this seemingly, right? So I took, that's what I was thinking, it just should be fine. Of course, he never can take on g2 because rook g5. However, we achieved right now a very, very strange position because <laughs> he has pawn on g7, I have pawn on g2. And uh, the question is, what? how to assess this? Like, who is better here? And the, the answer is the position is pretty much equal after only, but I have to play one specific move and uh, which, of course, I saw, but I saw also alternative. Uh, essentially, I saw two possible moves here for white, uh, sorry, for black, and uh, during the game it seemed like a coin flip which one is stronger. And I unfortunately I chose wrong. And yeah, so pretty much uh, after bishop e6 this is what I did, queen g3. My idea was to simply cover g4 square in any case and uh, just you know, play as so, play is solid. You know, bishop is well, well was well placed. It is uh, cannot be attacked from here. Seems like very solid move. However, bishop f3 is was alternative, which is I, what I saw, but it uh, uh, was much stronger, and this was uh, the best move uh, for black. But I didn't like it because of rook d4, and let's say if rook e8 or something, simply queen g3. This was I was worried about because right now, uh, if he can play rook f4, he will kick my bishop out, and whenever I retrieve the the bishop from f3. He will have some ideas of knight g4 and so on. So this is what I was worried about. But like I didn't realize that if I retrieve my bishop, let's say to c6 or somewhere on this diagonal, my pawns on g2 still defend it. So he cannot remove his knight from e3 because he will get checkmated with rook e1. So that's the big uh, that's the big difference right now between you know between those moves. Right now uh, he cannot take the, the g2 pawn and. Uh, Bishop on 6 is very active on this diagonal, but bishop on my rooks are connected. Knight g4 is never a threat. Suddenly, dynamically, uh, black is doing quite well. However, and this was correct, as I said, I play bishop e6, and after queen g3, we achieve similar position, but positions uh, right now are way different, and I think uh, from practical point of view, it is extremely difficult to play this position with black, and I couldn't find a move, to be honest, and like, I lost pretty quickly this, but uh, you know, anyway, position was extremely difficult already, at least from practical point of view. Of course, I could basically maybe trade take here, trade queens, but like as I said earlier, trading queens it means uh, accepting the fact that I'm you know simply worse here in this position. 
like uh, Rook Pawn G2 will fall at some point, so I will likely be with, uh, with uh, you know, down a pawn, with the position down a pawn, and this is certainly something, not something I enjoyed. So I tried to create some counterplay, I didn't want to trade queen, so I tried to play uh, h5, value of h4, but this is simply um, parried by uh, rook d4. King h7, whether rook j, rook g7, try to somehow uh, attack on the king side, but of course it doesn't work, rook d1. There are also other moves that win, but uh, this is one of the nicest, let's say, or simplest. Rook g8, f4 right now. Rook takes c5 and f5. And uh, suddenly my bishop that I thought is pretty safely located on e6 is actually not so safe because it underruns onto this f4, f5 idea. And uh, white simply wins. After the bishop takes f5, knight d5. The point is that uh, after, let's say, queen takes g7, there is queen d6. And uh, there is a problem, for, I'll just put it on the board, uh, queen d6, and uh, there is an knight f6, on the c5 is hanging, it seems it's just completely winning for, for white. So I decided to play queen h6, trying to sort of hold it together, uh, you know, my pawn on h6, try not, try not to give him knight f6, but after queen f2, I have no uh, good way to defend this bishop, and I decided, decided to give the exchange. Uh, for instance, if bishop e6, I, he goes with knight, uh, knight f6, so also doesn't work. So I play bishop, uh, the rook takes d5, this, this, rook takes g7, I try to hold it, but of course it's absolutely lost. Again, his king is very safe behind uh, the, uh, the, my, pawn, uh, my own pawn g2, and uh, there is nothing pretty much I can do here. Rook a6, he just collected one pawn. Maybe his technique would have been a little bit more, uh, let's say, accurate, but he never let me go in for a second here. So. He, Jeffrey converted pretty convincingly. So yeah, uh, this is how the game ended. Rook d4, rook h4, and this is here. I, this is where I resigned. Uh, it was a great game by Jeffrey, even though this knight c2 idea was maybe um, as sound as because of this knight f3 uh, possibility, but like then I had to be super um, accurate, and I made some mistakes, unfortunately I lost. So this is the game of uh, the first game I want to show, and second game I want to show today on Sveshnikov uh, was the actually critical game for US Championships uh, title because it was between two uh, players who were co-leading I think at this point uh, before the uh, round ten or uh, roughly round nine. It was between uh, Jeffrey uh, with black and uh, Wesley saw with with white pieces. So uh, the game um, I will actually put it right now from white's perspective. So the game follows with e4, c4, c5, Sveshnikov, bishop g5, a6, knight a3, b5, knight d5, bishop b7. Uh, Jeffrey chose bishop f6, Wesley chose knight d5, uh, bishop f6, c3, uh, bishop g5, knight c2, rook b8. This is all well-known theory. Um, modern trend, I think Daniel Lubov played it like well, first time. Also, I saw Jeffrey playing this against uh, Lanyard Dominguez. Uh, in St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. So um, definitely Jeffrey prepared some, had some you know, ideas here. Uh, Wesley played move a3, which is a little bit, um, I don't know how to put it, but like I thought it's a little bit mysterious move. Like before it's not really a threat still. So, but maybe it's kind of like waiting move. I, I, don't know, I always have kind of like issues understanding of what, why, why a3. Like, a4 is uh, logical because you change the pawn structure, right? But A3 seems like it's sort of a waste of time, but maybe not really because on the other hand what white is doing. Anyway, this is how the modern theory develops. Sometimes, you know, one move, one quiet move uh, and suddenly often maybe has no, no good response to this. This is not the case here, I think, but anyway, A3 leads to very, you know, interesting and playable positions too. So, short castle played Jeffrey and H, uh, West's idea was to play H4. Uh, of course, this is one, one of the typical ideas in Sveshnikov. You cannot take because of queen h5. After bishop h6, uh, the idea is to play g4. So Je uh, Wesley tries to play quickly g5 and uh, win this bishop, or, if, or in case of f6, the king side would be uh, pretty much uh, you know, weak. So uh, the best move right now is to play bishop f4. And queen f3. I assume that uh, Wesley played all those moves pretty quickly. Here we got to this, and uh, here, uh, sorry, the Wesley played this, I said Wesley, right? Uh, so I think, yeah, well, the Wesley played all those moves correctly, uh, quickly, 
and um, I'm not sure if Jeffrey was thinking or not, but uh, here in this position, I think Jeffrey made a mistake because, as I said, you know, initially, Sveshnikov is such an opening that you know, very dynamic play, very active and concrete play is pretty much required. You cannot just you know play passively or uh, you know uh, make some you know lousy moves like, for instance. Uh, I don't know, King HJ for instance here, like it would be just a waste of time, also on the forest hanging, so you need to sort of uh, some find a way to react to this. Either find counterplay or defend it somehow. So, um, as I said, Sveshnikov is a very dynamic opening, as is the entire Sicilian, to be honest. So, um, I, m what I analyzed after the, af you know, f after this game ended and like uh, on my own, I think that a five right now was one of the very interesting ways to approach this position as black. It's all again all about dynamics right now. If knight takes the four, seemingly white wins the pawn, right? Takes takes. What could be? Why would be so great for black? And the thing is that black simply plays before. Thanks to those pawns on g4, h4. White King has no really good way to. Uh, uh, there is no really good square or good, good or good place for White King here. Why, if White goes short castle, you know the, those pawns are you know exposed, uh, exposed in the king side, so the king will not be super safe on the king side too. Queen side, of course, is out of question, and center, you know, King never is or rarely is safe in the center. So suddenly, with this before White uh, Jeffrey would open the queen, the king, queen side and. Uh, Potentially create some weaknesses, so I thought that this this was correct play here, here by uh, by Black. After c4, for instance, I analyzed b3, knight e3, and uh, queen b6. And the idea is, of course, uh, to you know just develop all the pieces as quickly as possible. Maybe queen d4 could be a threat. Maybe queen b4 could be a threat, and uh, very dynamically put some pressure on uh, on white king, which is still in the center and it's not clear where is it going. Because let's say bishop e2, there queen b4 can, can follow, which is not easy to face as well. Uh, I thought rook d1, but then queen b4, king e2, knight d5, and it seems like black has great compensation here. For instance, f3 and rook a8, while they are rook a2, it feels like, uh, it doesn't feel like w white has any advantage here. If anyone has some initiative, it is black. So, uh, and the difference, the reason for this is basically the difference in king safety. Black's king is super safe, white's king, you know, is in the center, and uh, also white pieces are not well developed. Like bishop is still on f1, king is on h1, king is on e2. Looks like sort of, maybe it's bad reference, but like it looks like some sort of king's gambit, uh, where of course white king is in the center, right? So here is the similar thing. Even though white has extra pawn, white has a uh, very exposed king. So this is kind of typical play that you can expect, f uh, you know, in um, in Sveshnikov. You sacrifice a pawn for initiative. So a5 was basically the way to go here for black. Uh, however, Jeffrey played move bishop b7, which is the move that I don't really like. Um, you know, you played already rook b8. Try to utilize it. Is my thinking, or if you want to play with this bishop somewhere, play it maybe to e6. Uh, I don't know. Uh, seems like bishop e7 doesn't quite belong there, at least to me. Uh, and, but uh, bishop e7, after bishop e7, uh, it was Wesley's turn, and he also made a mistake. I guess, you know, first of all, in general, both game, this game, there were lots of mistakes from both sides, and I would find two explanations for this. First of all, uh, the time control. Actually, three, three reasons. The time control in rapid chess, unlike in uh, classical chess, uh, you know, the chance of inaccuracies or mistakes is much higher than in, um, you know, longer time controls. And uh, another thing is that uh, position itself is, in with this opening, is very complicated. And finally, the stake, the, you know, they were playing for the first place. So, um, Winner takes it all, pretty much, right? So uh, here, probably also nerves had, have been playing some role. So bishop b7 uh, played Jeffrey, and uh, Wesley played move g5. And actually, after I think that after g5, black could be new, could be better actually. Um, what's what's going on? Uh, the idea of bishop b7 is to basically, in case of knight f4, uh, play queen f6, and the, 
then white will, black will recapture uh, the pawn, uh, the, sorry, the piece on f4, and have this bishop e7 hitting on the center. So, but after knight d3, let's say queen f4, bishop g2. Uh, this is what I analyzed. Of course, if e takes f4, the knight d5 would follow, and uh, this should be better for white because white wins the pawn and black doesn't have enough compensation. Uh, you know, a a5 before as earlier is pretty much too slow. And um, here, sorry, uh, knight f4, queen f6, knight e3. If queen f4, bishop g2, I think that in this end game, uh, white is slightly better because of the bare pawn structure and, and this uh, backward d6 pawn that uh, will be under attack after, let's say, some rook d1 moves, knight f5, maybe doubling on the d-file, uh, all those moves, uh, all those ideas uh, white have. Uh, white has and black will be forced to be uh, on the defensive side here. And another possibility is to prepare pre prepare all of it with, with bishop g2 because I'm not sure how black is gonna defend f4 uh, for bishop uh, like you know the pawn there uh, anyway. Just to sum it up, I'm not sure what bishop b7 was bringing here, but uh, yeah, because of yeah those lines that I said, I think white is better. Uh, white is better there. Uh, however, Wesley played g5, and suddenly that bishop b7 idea could have been justified. Right now, if Jeffrey played move knight a5, you know, it's a pretty, uh, pretty natural move actually, because uh, you, are, you play bishop b7 first, then you want to open this bishop, uh, this diagonal for this bishop, and put some pressure on the center, especially on this knight on d5. The idea is, for instance, to maybe play knight b3, knight c5, one, di one idea. Second idea is to eliminate the knight from d5 and basically secure this bishop on f4. And if, this white, and if white, uh, sorry, black manages to accomplish that, I think black could be only better here. So it seems natural to take it, take the pawn. Uh, but after this, bishop e4 suddenly works. White's king is exposed in the center, so uh, you cannot just freely take this pawn on e4. Uh, just to show quickly, you cannot take because rook e8 uh, wins the queen, right? So um, you cannot take the pawn, and let's say if you go short uh, long castle, suddenly f5 becomes very interesting choice by black, and position gets extremely complicated. But if anyone's taking any risk right now, I think it's, it is white. For instance, after queen f4, f takes e4, there are ideas of e3, there are ideas of rook f3, pawn f2 is a weak pawn as well. I Probably with correct play, black can, sorry, white can sort of hold it, but uh, it is extremely dangerous. For instance, queen takes d6 would already lose the game. After knight b3, king b2, king b1 takes, takes, and e3 simply wins the game on the spot. Um, yeah, like I, I don't see the one f2 is falling, the pawn, the e pawns, you know, very, like, very likely will just be promoted the queen. Uh, also, we're going to join Sengi, so we cannot take on e3 as well. So, um, knight a5 would be, would basically shift the uh, initiative to, towards towards black, and uh, why, and I think white would be pretty much in trouble, at least from practical point of view. However, Jeffrey played rook e8, and I don't like this move because, again, it's kind of passive. Like, if you play this opening, you need to play very, very active, right? And the same thing happened in my previous game against Jeffrey because I had two moves, bishop f3, bishop e6, and I chose the more passive, more solid one instead of bishop f3, which is more aggressive one, which is more forward, right? And the same thing happens here. Rook e8 is kind of like more passive move. Knight a5, if I have taking bishop d5 and then, you know, playing maybe for f5 and so on, seems very, very strong because it's more dynamic and more aggressive. Uh, in the game happened right now, it takes a four, it takes a four, and I think after a long castle, uh, Wesley is doing great again. Um, he has great position uh, right now, pawn on four is hanging, pawn on d6 also is potentially weak. However, there are certain tactical ideas involving this, on this, uh, I mean, involving this bishop and rook on this diagonal. Let's say, pawn on e4 is pretty weak, right? So when, if we can somehow remove this knight from there tactically, uh, pawn on e4 will be hang, will fall, and rook with it, rook on h1 will be under attack too. So uh, right now, Jeffrey probably sensed that if he doesn't do right now if something very concrete or, dyna or dynamic, he would just lose the pawn and uh, he would not have any compensation for this. Therefore, 
he was looking for drastic measures and he found one with, uh, which was moved to play b4. And this move uh, is very sharp, that's for sure. And uh, it creates lots of pressure, on, uh, like, you know, more like tension on the king's, sorry, queen side and the center too. So a takes b4, knight takes b4. Uh, obviously, you have to remove the knight to, uh, to access the e4 pawn. And right now, uh, Jeff, uh, sorry, Wesley had two possibilities. Either take the knight on b4 or take the pawn on b4. Nothing else. You have to take the knight. The question is with what? And uh, as I said, most likely because of the nerves and kind of like the stake of the tournament or also the rapid time control, he wanted to make quick decision. And um, maybe, you know, in such position, you have simply have to calculate and calculate very accurately. Because position is pretty much crazy. If you make one mistake in calculation, the game could be over. And this is exactly what could have happened actually in this game. Uh, so, Right now, Jeffrey, uh, sorry, Wesley played knight takes before, and this was a mistake. Um, the best move was to play the, the pawn on before. After bishop takes e4, play simply queen h3. The point is that white doesn't have to be worried about opening the c file because bishop d3 is coming next. And if bishop is coming d3 to d3 next, it secures everything on the queen side, and the game is uh, the black's initiative will pretty much evaporate very soon. For instance, if a bishop takes c2, you try and prevent bishop takes d3, but black white can simply take, rook takes b4, but then just, for instance, queen c3, uh, securing on b2. I, if I secure on b2, I will be fine. Queen c1, and bishop c4 is coming. I don't see any follow-up to black's initiative right now. I think white is simply winning. So, um, if queen c7, on the other hand, why well, can play this time bishop d3 and after bishop takes h1, rook takes h1. I don't see really uh, what black can do. Uh, okay, rook takes b4 still can be played obviously, but after h5, white can simply ignore uh, black's activity, which is nearly gone, pretty much is, is not existent anymore. Uh, pawn uh, and white simply continues to attack on the king side. White wants to play g6 and to destroy uh, black's king and same time leaving our white king pretty safe on the on c1 or on sub, in general on the queen side pretty much black has no manpower sort of to continue the the initiative here while white has a uh, potential of creating you know uh, some very strong attack on the king side so if this happened i think uh, jeff uh, sorry wesley would have had big advantage however such i you know deciding in such position after net takes before which move is correct requires lots of, you know, caution and uh, I don't know how to put it, but uh, very, very uh, strong nerves to basically with to be cold blooded, uh, sort of, and, and super calm and play C takes before in such positions. It's very difficult. So knight takes before is more human, obviously. However, bishop takes e4. After bishop takes e4, uh, right now Wesley played again a mistake. He played queen takes f4, which is again the most, let's say, human move. Um, well, maybe not the most human move, but like, you know, the kind of logical move because uh, you want to eliminate, you, you can take the pawn. What could be wrong with the, ta what could be wrong with the taking, uh, with taking the pawn, right? And uh, seemingly also queen goes to the dark square. So stabilizing the, let's say, a little bit the center. <clears throat> or like, you know, um, the queen will not go under any attack and things like that. Uh, so, we'll see in a moment what happened after queen, day, what could have happened after queen f4, but queen h3 was the only move. And after rook takes b4, c takes b4, queen c8, very strong move. Uh, idea is to basically, uh, you know, if queen c8, let's say rook c8 and uh, rook on h1 falls. Bishop takes h1, and I think in this endgame, black, sh black, should, uh, black should be doing quite okay. Should be eventually a draw. Uh, however, there is move queen c3. It's just a very difficult move to play, obviously. After bishop h1, uh, there, is, there are several options for white. I think that, the, for instance, bishop h3, uh, I don't know, queen c6, uh, sorry, queen b7, rook d6, Bishop f3, this position is extremely difficult to play for with both colors. Both king, white king is exposed, but so is black king, even though it seems like it's 
shelter by its own phones, but so there are certain backring issues. So the position is you know, pretty much difficult to play for with both colors. I think it's still that white is slightly better, but uh, not more than that. Um, while well, definitely it's a very complicated position and anything can happen technically. So uh, this was correct way to play Buzz White. Instead, uh, Jeff, uh, Wesley played Queen takes f4, and right now uh, Jeffrey missed a golden opportunity to win the game nearly on the spot. Because he played move rook takes b4, which is seemingly very natural, because after c takes b4, uh, queen c7 is just with mating attack, and rook b4, therefore, seemingly is the most natural move to play. However, you play queen a5. You also, on, on top of rook takes b4, you want to play queen a1 and queen takes b2 and uh, attack the white king in this way. Again, this opening l involves lots of dynamic and concrete play, and um, you need to basically be ready for, su for such, uh, such moves, uh, or you know, fighting, you know, solving such moves. And it's not easy for anyone to play uh, like this. So queen a5 suddenly uh, was... I need to fix your microphone. Oh. You turn it off? Yeah, that's what's All right, there we go. You're good. All right. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Anyway, uh, Queen A5 was uh, basically a very powerful option uh, here for Jeffrey. Um, unfortunately, he, for him, he missed it. The point is that right now, queen a1, queen b2 is just very, very strong uh, threat and nearly irresistible. Uh, if knight c2, queen a2 wins. Like, I don't see a move technically for, for white because queen b2 just follows. Uh, if bishop d3, bishop takes h1 right now. If rook takes h1, queen uh, a1. And uh, if king goes, queen takes h1, and rook, uh, rook b, bishop b1, then come, rook, another rook comes to e2. So suddenly black is in uh, drive, driver's seat, and uh, white king is near, pretty much getting mated right now. So I thought f3 was the only try, but after bishop g2, actually black has extra exchange. And uh, not only there is extra exchange, but it is black who has initiative on, 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 uh, on white, against white's king. For instance, bishop c, bishop c4, just king h8, we can just ignore this f7 pawn. The most important is our own, our own king's safety too. h5, let's say bishop h3, I'll analyze. If h6, uh, bishop f5, bring the bishop to the correct diagonal. I threatening queen a1 again. After hg, both king h7, uh, both king takes g7, I mean, and king g8 win. King j4 like, is a little bit more simple because it doesn't even allow queen d4 check. So uh, black would be just winning here. There is no way that white could uh, create any danger to black king right now. Uh, so yeah, queen a5 would pretty much actually win the game. I don't see uh, actually the defense right now for, uh, for white. Because um, what to do? Like queen a1 suddenly is a big threat and it's not easy to defend. Also rook takes before is still in the air. You can play this you know, very, very soon. So yeah, rook to queen takes a5, queen a5 would be just be crushing probably. However, uh, you know, of course, it's not an easy move to play and to understand, it, especially when you see such tempting move like bishop, like rook takes before. And you know, the, as I said, the main reason of all those mistakes, in, in, like in general, in rapid chess, is the time control. It's not that people can play chess; it's just because the rush decisions sometimes lead to incorrect decisions. And uh, with rapid chess. Uh, it is. It is, is how it is, basically. Uh, also, if I if I played, uh, if I had this position previous my, my previous game against Jeffrey uh, that I showed, and I have to decide bishop, between bishop f3 and bishop e6, also would be different. Let's say classical game, I would have higher chance of making of understanding what's really going on uh, rather than simply guessing. Because for me it was a coin flip. I didn't want to spend too much time. I just wanted to make a move, and uh, because both moves seemed equal to me, and they were not. 
So this is prob probably the time control and like the pressure on making the move is uh, the source of mistakes here. So uh, rook takes before is what Jeffrey plays, very logical move, but suddenly after bishop d3, uh, there is no clear follow-up what to do here uh, with, uh, with black. And the position right now is just equal. And uh, Jeffrey plays right now bishop takes h1, and this is, again, a little bit inaccurate. It's you know, natural, but also a little bit inaccurate. In my opinion, what was correct is to play rook a4, and uh, the point is just just uh, let's say from kind of like perspective, human perspective, why uh, there is no reason to, because what, what bishop h1 accomplishes is to trade this rook for this rook. And rook on b4 is very active. Rook on h1 doesn't, hasn't done anything yet. So there is makes little sense to trade the active rook for a very passive rook. So therefore I think rook a4 was uh, stronger. But black is what is obviously fine as rook a3, let's say here, rook a1, King d2, take, take, bishop takes d3, king takes d3. And uh, king on d3 is a little bit exposed, true, but there is no way to get to these kings. Let's say after rook e6, uh, black uh, would be just, position would be just equal, I think. Uh, yeah, but in this position, Jeffrey played rook, bishop takes h1, and so suddenly after, uh, right now, queen takes b4, bishop f3, queen d2, rook d2. Suddenly, I think white is slightly better. Because right now, uh, white has, uh, sorry, black has weaknesses, pawn on a6 and pawn on d6. Uh, pawns h4, g5 uh, restrict black's king, and uh, it is not easy for black uh, to, you know, to solve, let's say, sometimes back rank issues, because you never want to play move like g6, because it weakens all the dark squares around your king, and moves like h6 al always allow g takes h6, which destroys the king. Uh, king's, you know, defensive, um, king, king's pawn defense. Um, so, suddenly I think white is slightly better. Objectively, according to engines, obviously black is doing quite okay still, but let's say on human, from human point of view, all of, look, just white is, has everything protected. If I play, let's say, b3, king b2, my king also, I will not have any issues on the back rank as well. I can play, let's say, bishop c2 then, attack this d6 pawn and uh, maybe challenge the bishop from a free somehow. It seems like white has lots of ideas and black is, has to be general on the defensive side. So Jeffrey right now probably realized that and he played move d5, trying to, I don't know, maybe play d4 or, some, or something, I have no idea. Uh, or maybe just to just to defend this d pawn, like um, pretty, seems pretty, pretty logical. Uh, on the other hand, I think that rook e1 and g6 would be uh, quite okay still for black, trying to, first of all, solve the back rank issue and try to hope that, you know, making um, the whole the dark squares around the king will not be too, uh, too problematic because um, of the counterplay that white black tries to create on white's king. Still, I think white is slightly better here because of move like, for instance, b3 and king b2, bishop c2, as I said, the same plan as I said earlier. However, um, bishop a6 also is possible, but unnecessary for now, I think. Uh, b3, king b2, bishop c2 uh, uh, would be much, let's say, more solid. The thing is, after bishop takes a6, let's say d5, I don't know, queen c5 or something, bishop e4, the king White king is constantly under some pressure. Yes, you can play move, maybe move like bishop d3, but then if we, if we trade uh, those uh, bishops, there will be always some checks on on, the, on this king, and black will have some hopes to create, you know, counterplay on the, on, uh, against white's king. Therefore, uh, I think if white can manage at first to hide the king first, b3, king b2 on the dark squares, uh, play bishop c2, but I, but why would be slightly better here? Jeffrey played d5, which is also, you know, quite logical. And uh, uh, again, b3 and the idea king b2 was uh, the way to go here for white with, with advantage. Um, Wesley was greedy. <laughs> he took out the pawn on a6. There's also nothing wrong with that, apart from the fact that it's not uh, the, the move that keeps the advantage or gives the advantage. Uh, first thing to understand here, king of the safe, uh, safety of the king. Uh, and with the castle on opposite sides, king's safety 
is even more of a concern that uh, or like priority that you know player has to pay attention to. Uh, so b3 can be two at first and then think about some some other stuff. Because after bishop a6, uh, it you know suddenly you know first of all I can play just rook e1 what uh, what I said earlier and then say g6 and a similar position to what what, what we discussed earlier actually I think it's the same one. Uh, so. Uh, as discussed earlier, black has some compensation here. On top of that, black has a number of other possibilities. For instance, h6, and this is what Jeffrey played. Basically, right now, Jeffrey undermines the pawn structure, and because this pawn bishop on a6 is misplaced, uh, there are uh, certain drawing uh, or like you know equalizing ideas for black. For instance, after g takes h6, the point is to play rook e4. With bishop on d3, it was never possible, right? With b uh, bishop on a6, suddenly is misplaced, and there is such idea. Such idea exists right now. So the point is, uh, and right now I think black is doing well. For instance, after queen c5 is what happened in the game, uh, but let's, oh, queen c5 happened in the game. Let's see what happens after rook d4. Uh, after rook d4, queen h4, uh, queen b8, king h7, h6, g7, rook e1. Uh, position gets totally crazy. King b3, just king takes g7. I have no idea who is better here, or like, who has better chances to you know be better in the future, because it seems like completely insane position like both sides have uh, a very exposed kings is equal material all both white and black pieces are very active to be honest it's just a mess it's, to me it's just a mess this position uh, I don't know I don't know <laughs> anything anything can happen that's for sure so uh, this doesn't lead to advantage for white and after queen c5 Right now, uh, Jeffrey made a mistake. Probably, I, I guess he was in time trouble or something. Again, time pressure and tight rapid time control. In normal time control, I, I he for sure will have more time. And uh, right now, he played rook takes h4, which is a big mistake. Uh, and again, in such dynamic opening like Sveshnikov, you can sort of back out. You have to fully act maximize activity of all your pieces, not only just one or two, all of them. So. If you play rook e1 right now, king c2 and queen h4, actually you are bringing the queen to the game. After rook h, on the other hand, after rook h4, the queen is still on d8. It's passive, right? So if the rook queen is passive, that is unlikely that black will have any good chances of creating counterattack on white's king. On the other hand, after rook e1, queen, king c2, queen h4, uh, black activates all the pieces, including the queen. Suddenly, queen a4, sorry, just. Uh, market here. Queen a4 could be an idea. I mean, actually, is an idea. It's just a winning idea if uh, black was on the move. So white has to uh, react to this. Uh, for instance, queen d4, trying to trade the queens. Just queen takes h6. So right now, we captured the, uh, the pawn of the queen. And uh, again, it's a completely unclear position, but I don't think black uh, has any uh, reasons to worry here, to be worried here. And um, of course, hg7 loses because of queen a4. So you can't, you, you don't have time to capture this, g, this g7 pawn. So Jeffrey played queen rook h4, and uh, again, probably both both West and Jeffrey were in time trouble because I failed to uh, understand why Jeffrey uh, why West didn't take on g7. I don't see any attack here uh, for uh, for black, and it seems like it just collects the pawn and White simply wins. Uh, king g7, for instance, just bishop e2. Trying to trade one pair of the, the bishops. It's just extra pawn. Like, and the white black king is more exposed actually than white's king. So it uh, it should be simply winning for black. I analyze, for instance, rook h1, rook d1. If queen g5, just queen e3. Trying to trade simply everything and uh, retain the extra pawn and simply win the game. So uh, I think this was simply winning. I guess it was mis missed chance for here for Wesley. However, his choice is also very easy and logical to uh, understand from human point of view, because queen of queen c8 trades queens, and uh, you want to normally if the position is so complicated and you're under attack, trading queens seems like a reasonable option. It and it, in, indeed it is. Uh, what the end the resulting endgame is somewhat better for white. But it's not like uh, it's winning or something like this. It's not. On the other hand, just H, uh, sorry, H takes G7 just wins the game here on the spot. I don't see any compensation here for black whatsoever. After Queen C8, though, we enter this uh, this end game 
rook h6, bishop b7, this will probably Joel Wesley's point. And the idea is that the uh, pawn defies the weakness, and it's easier, a little bit easier, to push white pawns and uh, black pawns on the on the queen side. Uh, here, it's not anymore <laughs> about the opening; it's more like you know what you know what they were doing in this end game. So uh, it's not of that much of an importance for the you know topic for today, which is the opening and let's say dynamic play in uh, in Sveshnikov or Sicilian. But anyway, I thought this endgame very instructive because till the end uh, it was all about dynamics. So let's just let's just have a look of what, of what happened and what could have happened here. So rook h5, logical move defending the pawn, and b4. King f8, uh, logic very logical. King needs to be activated, and uh, king b2. King also white also activates the king. Right now, we just play rook f5, and I, I don't understand this move really. I mean, I understand that he wants to defend this a free bishop because c4 could be a threat, but uh, it seems more natural to play a move like king e7 to me. Um, but yeah, but yeah, but it's uh, probably rook f5 is also quite okay. Uh, king e7, I would probably play, and I don't see any big problems with that. However, you know, we have to consider c4, maybe this is what he didn't like. Uh, rook f5, king b3, king e7 right now, king a4, g5. Both sides try to activate the kings and uh, push the pawns. And right now, uh, G uh, Wesley played b5. And uh, this move was basically uh, ruining uh, like little chances that White actually had here uh, to win the game. He won the game eventually because Jeffrey made a mistake, but the best move was here bishop a8. Uh, and the idea here is to basically push uh, the pawn only now. But bishop a is simply an inhuman move to, to be played. So I analyze this quite a lot, and uh, I'm more than happy to show this, but I'm a I'm little bit worried that we'll run out of time and uh, another lesson is coming. So uh, I will just skip this for now. Um, maybe one of the lessons about end games, in, say, in the end game or something, like that, I will talk about this end game too. So um, in the game, I have b5. Rook f4, king a5, king d6. Right now, position is very balanced. It uh, depends, you know, uh, black. I mean, black king is pretty much very close to the king to the queen side, and uh, tries to uh, prevent this pawn from uh, b pawn from queening. But mm, b6, rook c4 um, happened. Rook d3, rook c5. And black has enough comp black has enough comp uh, compensation from the in the form of activity active piece uh, active active rook on c5 active bishop on uh, f3 which can let's say go to e4 or e2 and then basically maybe play rook b5 or something like this. Um, Jeffrey, uh, no, I mean sorry, Wesley didn't want to make a draw, and he, he play uh, he moved his back. With, with his king back to uh, b3 instead of just repeating with king b5, uh, sorry, king a5, king b4, and uh, with a draw. He played king b3 trying to play for a win. Uh, after rook f4, he played c move c4. And uh, here, king c5 was okay, still, c takes d4, rook to rook b4, king c3. And uh, right now, uh, Jeffrey made a mistake. Uh, which give practical which gave practical chances to uh, to Wesley. He played move rook takes b6. However, the best uh, you know or one of the easiest ways to make a draw was simply bishop b4 because those pawns, uh, white pawns, are not going anywhere. They, they are pinned, right? Um, and you know if we hit the rook and maybe play rook c4, or c4 is always the idea. Uh, we can uh, simply uh, you know create immediate counterplay like that. After d6, for instance, I've, there's one very interesting line. Bishop takes d3, uh, d7, rook d4, bishop d5, takes b7. Actually, white promotes to the queen, but after bishop g6, it's simply a fortress. There is no way white could win that. Um, rook takes b6, on the other hand, uh, gave, black gave to Wesley practical chances and probably in time trouble, mm, Jeffrey made a mistake. Uh, because of the time trouble, Jeffrey made later a mistake and lost the game. Because after d6, this, this, it's all forced. You have to take the, you have to re give the rook for the, for the bishop. Right now, uh, Jeffrey played move f5, which is uh, a losing move uh, because it. Right now, uh, after f5, both pawns are easily easily attacked uh, by the um, uh, by the by by white rook. 
instead if, if bishop d5 happened, probably, I would say it very cautiously, probably it would still be a draw, somehow. Uh, it's very difficult still from practical point of view, but probably it's still, uh, there were some chances to make a draw. At least with my analysis, after let's say king d3, bishop b6, rook d8, bishop f5, uh, king e3, king c4, for instance, here I didn't find any ways to uh, find to, to win this with, with black uh, with white. I mean, let's say if uh, rook g8, g4, uh, rook d8 back to cut the king, bishop e6. I don't see a follow up here for white. Let's say king goes forward or something. We just go. Uh, sorry, uh, if king goes forward, just king c3. For instance, There's just no way to. Uh, I know I, the, the only idea is to kind of like play at some point rook c7, maybe try to kick, kick, kick this king out, but uh, if I don't, if I'm out of the opposition, it will never be possible pretty much. So if you, I don't see a clear way for white to win this, because this seems like a fortress with both bishop on e6 and covering both uh, f7 and g4 pawns. Anyway, this was uh, probably still a draw, but I, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying this with 100% guarantee. Uh, how, but what I can say is that 100% guarantee f5 was a losing move because after king d3, king e3, g4, this blockade uh, or like this uh, setup simply doesn't hold because white can surround f5 pawn and eventually uh, win it. For instance, king f4 happened again, king c6, rook f7, and this is how the game ended. And one way or another, white would eventually manage to uh, get get there and uh, transform uh, to the following pawn end game, pawn, pawn ending, which is the theoretically obviously winning. So after rook takes a five, uh, Jeffrey resigned and Wesley sort of won very important game uh, to win fully deservedly US 2020 US Championships. Uh, so to sum it up quickly, Sveshnikov is a very interesting opening, obviously. There is lots of going on. There is lots of theory you have to study. However, what, what is very important uh, in this opening, you have, you have to play very dynamic and very concrete chess. And um, sometimes one move, not the right direction, can just be terrible for you. So they have to be very careful and be uh, calculating a lot and calculating well. So that's all for, for this lesson and I will see you guys soon with, with the next one which will be Games of the Week.